In this video, I'm going to summarize the importance of the acid-base disorders. Especially, I'm going to help you how you can recognize and how you can uh, diagnose the special type of acid-base disorders. To understand the whole, you should look at that other YouTube video that the link is posted right here. For the sample uh, acid-base, we are going to withdraw the blood for the artery, mainly from the radial or brachial or femoral artery. That's an invasive procedure, and you have to be very cautious, especially in those patients who is taking some anticoagulant. The artery blood gas analysis is an essential part of the diagnosing and managing the patient's oxygen status, ventilation failure, and acid-base balance. This is what we are going to discuss during the uh, respiratory failure lectures as well. The other blood gas uh, spacement handling should be taken very carefully. An anticoagulant, the sodium and lithium heparin, is used to anticoagulant the blood. This blood should be collected anaerobically, meaning that it should not be any air bubbles inside, because the air has different PCO2 value and PO2 value, and this is why the air contaminated samples has completely different results. The sample should be analyzed as soon as possible because red blood cells is a living tissue and they are going to consume oxygen and produce carbon dioxide, so the value that you are going to detect if you are waiting longer, that's be completely inappropriate. Uh, the hemostat or the acid base balance is influenced by the production of the hydrogen and the elimination of the hydrogen. The production rate is going to depend on the endogenous production, such as the aerobic condition when we are going to burn the carbon moiety to carbon dioxide, and this way we are going to produce about 15 mole of carbon dioxide as a volatile acid and the other substance, such as, comp uh, for example, the amino acid that contains sulfur or amino groups or the phospholipids, the phosphate, usually they are producing during the metabolic uh, processes a non volatile acid that the kidney should be eliminated from the body. First of all, the produced hydrogen is buffered by the buffer system of the, the body. And later on, there are other organs that are taking place, very important role to eliminate the acid, such as the lung that is going to eliminate the carbon dioxide, the kidney mainly that eliminate the non volatile acids, liver and the bone as well. The bone usually is taking place in the longer term of acidemia when the proton is absorbed by the bone, the loosely bound calcium released, so including the sodium and potassium as well, and in a long-term situation that they can produce osteoporosis. Let's look at first the buffering capacity or the buffer system in our body. Mainly, that's the bicarbonate, hemoglobin, phosphate and protein. Now, bicarbonate is not the strongest buffer capacity. The hemoglobin has the strongest one. However, because we are living in an open air and we are going to burn the carbon moiety, this is why the bicarbonate buffer system is very important and this is how we are going to calculate the acid-base balance based on the carbon dioxide and the bicarbonate ratio. However, the hemoglobin is the biggest and the strongest buffer capacity in our body. However, the concentration is not changing as fast as the bicarbonate. This is why we are not going to consider, not going to interfere with the acid-base balance. However, if somebody does have, for example, anemia has a lower hemoglobin concentration, that could affect the acid-base balance as well, and that could mean that a certain amount of acid production is going to influence the pH more readily when we comparing to those situations when we do have a normal hemoglobin concentration. As we said already, that the lung is usually affecting the PCO2 value, as the pump is going to eliminate the PCO2 from the artery, from the vein immediately. The kidney is capable to, first of all, to filtrate bicarbonate 
or and produced bicarbonate. Every bicarbonate molecules is filtrated. However, the 85% is reabsorbed in the proximal tubules. An additional 50% can be reclaimed in the distal tubules together with the excretion of the hydrogen molecules. The liver usually is preventing the accumulation of the ammonium and as a living tissue is going to produce carbon dioxide from the oxidation of substrates, but it does have some other important role, for example, metabolize of the acids uh, ions such as the lactate, ketone bodies and amino acids and ammonium and forming urea. And meanwhile, they are going to use bicarbonate. Another important role of the liver to produce protein, especially albumin. And albumin, depending on the environmental pH, they are going to uh, produce or dissociate more hydrogen or absorb more hydrogen. It does have an important role to buffering the proton in our body. Uh, the basic concept of the acid-base balance of the calculation is, is going back to about 100 years ago when henderson hasselblad equation came into the picture. As you see here, basically the pH is determined by the ratio of the base and the acid, logarithmic of the acid and the base. Now, we consider it as a base in our body as the bicarbonate, while the acidity is the CO2, so the carbon dioxide. Now, this is the pH, is expressed as the pH. However, pH is a double uh, altered uh, measures because it's saying that the negative logarithmic of the hydrogen ion concentration. So, as a logarithmic, relatively, the changes is very much blunted and the negative is inverse comparing to the hydrogen ion concentration. This was the essential one in long time ago because we, they could measure only the pH. But today we can calculate and we can measure directly the hydrogen ion concentration and usually they are expressing the hydrogen ion concentration. And the hydrogen ion is ranging from 36 to 44 nanomole per liter. About two orders of magnitude is less comparing to the sodium or potassium. Now the normal value is about around 7.4 and this is the optimal one. If you are going to have a higher pH, less hydrogen, that's an alkalic milieu and an acidic milieu as well. The opposite. Now, as a terminology, we should say a little bit differently what you used to it. If somebody has a lower pH, in our body, so they do have an increase of the hydrogen concentration. This is what we call the acidemia, very similarly to the hyperkalemia. So that's a concentration. Alkalemia, when we do have less hydrogen ion, when the pH is increased. And acidosis or alkalosis, called those processes, that is going to alter the hydrogen ion concentration, those metabolic processes that are going to accumulate the hydrogen in our body, that's called acidosis. And when going to use up the hydrogen or produces bicarbonate, this is the alkalotic or alkalosis. At the same time in our body, there are zillions of metabolic processes that produces or using up the hydrogen. And the net, the sum of these uh, processes, going to influence or going to determine the pH or the hydrogen ion concentration in our body. So this is why amia is the final. And those processes that leading to acidemia or alkalemia, those are the osis or acidosis or alkalosis, so those are the processes. Now what will happen when we do have a, a alteration of this acid-base balance? If we do have acidemic stages, when we do have a low pH, usually the contractile function of the muscle, the cardiac muscle, is decreased as very similarly, the vascular response to catecholamines and diminished response to effect of action of certain mediators as well. Uh, alkalemic stage, such as the high pH, interferes mostly with the tissue oxygenation. That is going to alter the oxygen uh, 
dissociation curve of the hemoglobin and that can cause hypoxemia in the periphery but is going to alter again the normal neurological and muscular function as well. Significant changes of the blood pH above 7.8 or below 6.8 will interfere with the cellular functioning and if it's uncorrected that's be lethal and that causes death the patient. Let's talk about now the evolution of the acid-based status, especially first the simple acid-based disorders. Now, uh, the Sigur Anders nomogram is not used today. However, it's very easy to understand the different changes and comparing the different parameters that we can determine based on this uh, nomogram or based on the today's evaluations. Long time ago, when this Astrup measurement was introduced, basically they were collecting three samples, A, B and C. A and B samples, or the two samples, was used to equilibrate the samples with different PCO2s and they measured the pH. What they could do? Only measuring pH. And the third one only measured the pH and from this pH they could calculate it, the all parameters including the PCO2, actual bicarbonate, standard bicarbonate, buffer base and base access. Let's see how did it work. Basically, in A samples that was equilibrated, for example, 20 millimercury of PCO2 and another one was 60, and they could get two points, and that was connected, and that was the line, the standard bicarbonate line, and the third uh, samples was used to measure the pH, and from this one they could calculate the PCO2. Now, uh, that was uh, in 1950s, when polio was in endemic and that was very important to determine the PCO2 level of the children when and this could give them a very important note when they should start to ventilate the patient and this way they could not be suffocated and could not be dying. Let's see the parameters of the acid-base balance. First of all, the pH is going to tell us the hydrogen ion concentration. The normal value is 7.4 plus minus 5. PCO2 is going to give us important information about the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in the blood. And that's usually the respiratory side of the parameters. Normally, 40 millimercury plus minus 5 millimercury. The actual bicarbonate is going to depend on the metabolic and the respiratory component as well. The normal values is 24 plus minus 2. The standard bicarbonate is going to be standardized and going to eliminate the respiratory effect on the bicarbonate by equilibrating or by adjusting the PCO2 to the 40 millimercury and this way the change is only made by metabolic component. As a normal situation, because the PCO2 is 40, this actual bicarbonate and standard bicarbonate is equal to each other. The buffer base, the all buffering system component, especially the uh, anion component of the buffer system, that you know that uh, bicarbonate, hemoglobin, phosphate, and protein, this is the sum. Now, how does it depend on metabolic and respiration? As because it's included the bicarbonate, hypothetically the CO2 is going to interfere or affect it. Yes, it's true. However, if you can recall what we studied in the lecture, what will happen in the periphery when the oxygen is dissociated off from the hemoglobin and the hemoglobin, negatively charged hemoglobin, is very alkalic milieu and the CO2 made proton and bicarbonate in the same time, the hydrogen is going to buffer immediately the hemoglobin. So this way, one hemoglobin molecule, one negatively charged buffer component decreased or eliminated, and one negatively charged bicarbonate is produced. So the net or the sum is be not changed by CO2, so by respiration. So this is only a metabolic component. The base excess, this was the first parameter that they measure directly by giving acids or alkalic solution to the blood to normalize the pH. However, today they are going to determine. It's a simple equation based on the difference between the measured and the normal buffer base and that's going to give us the base excess. That's the normal value is 0 plus minus 2 millimole per liter. 
today's uh, the Arthropod guys analyzers are completely different from the old time. Now we are able to measure the pH, the hydrogen ion concentration. We can measure directly the CO2 concentration and the oxygen concentration. Uh, and this way we can uh, evaluate directly the acid base status, the adequacy of the alveolar ventilation, the pump function of the lung, and the diffusion by measuring the PO2 values. Other parameters such as the bicarbonate, the base excess, and the uh, oxygen saturation is uh, calculated from the data. And as you see, the actual bicarbonate is used to acid-base status evaluation and the base excess again, and the saturation of the oxygen, usually the uh, oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin is used to evaluate. Now, acid-base disorders can be distributed into two parts, the simple acid-base disorders and the mixed acid-base disorders. The simple means there is only one primary disorder and there is no additional one. The additional may be only the compensation, but that's it. The mixed one, at the same time, there are two or more primary disorders present at the same time. We are talking about the respiratory disorders when the PCO2 is the first that is affected, while the metabolic one, when the first one, the bicarbonate, is affected. We are talking about metabolic acidosis if we do have a decrease of the bicarbonate, or alkalosis when we do have an increase of the bicarbonate. So the pH is going to elevate it, and meanwhile the bicarbonate elevated, that's the primary metabolic alkalosis. If we do have a decreased pH together with a decreased bicarbonate, that means it's a primary metabolic acidosis. Very similar to the respiration, if we do have a pH that is less than the normal, so it's acidemia, and the PCO2 is higher one, that's the respiratory acidosis. Why the pH is going to increase, so that's the alkalemia, and meanwhile the PCO2 is less, that's the respiratory alkalosis. Compensation. When we do have a primary acid-base disorders, the body attempts to regulate the pH, so it wants to normalize the pH and usually by the other component, the metabolic or the respiratory component is going to change the opposite way. So if we do have a primary metabolic disorder such as a metabolic acidosis, the respiration is going to produce a respiratory alkalosis, the opposite. If we do have a metabolic alkalosis, the respiration is going to produce a respiratory acidosis by altering the pH in the opposite way. Similarly to the primary respiratory disorders, if we do have a respiratory alkalosis, what will be happening? The body is going to produce a metabolic acidosis. Body means the kidney. Or if we do have a respiratory acidosis, the kidney is going to produce a metabolic alkalosis. Very importantly, the body cannot compensate back to the normal. We always have a little difference between the compensated and the normal situation. As long as the underlying problem is there, we do have a difference. This difference is going to drive the compensation. And it's very important, another one, because we cannot compensate back to normal, or completely normal. This is, we cannot overcompensate and undercompensate. That meaning we do have another underlying disorders in the system as well. Let's summarize these situations in this table. The primary disorders, such as a metabolic acidosis, when we do have a decrease of the plasma bicarbonate level, the compensation done by the respiration, what will happen is a hyperventilation. It works right away immediately. And later on, about two to three days, a maximum of five days, the kidney is going to compensate as well, unless the kidney is a problem that causes the metabolic acidosis. Metabolic alkalosis, when we do have an accumulation of the bicarbonate, the ventilation decreased. However, this compensation is limited by hypoxia. And later on, the kidney is taking place as well. As respiratory acidosis, when we do have an accumulation of the PCO2 in the body and 
very slowly the kidney is going to increase the renal absorption of the bicarbonate in the proximal tubule and later on in the distal one they are going to excrete that's it the proton and further distal tubule plasma bicarbonate absorption can be or the respiratory alkalosis when we do have a hyperventilation again the kidney is going to take place is a compensation and is going to decrease the reabsorption of the bicarbonate so losing the bicarbonate and retaining the proton in our body so this is how they are going to compensate these underlying primary disorders let's start with uh, respiratory acidosis when the pco2 is higher than 45 that's hypercapnia that can due to some pump failure of the lung for example the respiratory centers are affected or the muscle the, the paralysis of the muscle that's going to alter or inappropriate way to pumping or ventilating the uh, lung or emphysema or acute conditions such as the adult respiratory distress syndrome where the alveolar uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch is going to take place pulmonary edema or pneumothorax so they all can cause respiratory acidosis now by looking at the Sigur Anders and nomogram only to understand the changes that today's are not used now what will happen when we do have a respiratory acidosis primary we do have an increase of the pco2 value that meaning that we are going to go up on the standard bicarbonate line that's what we happen because we do have more co2 that producing more hydrogen or more bicarbonate this is why the actual bicarbonate increases and the pH goes down because we produce hydrogen let's see on the cigar on the nomogram we are going to move up on the line of the standard bicarbonate and more CO2 shifting the pH down and if you look at the actual bicarbonate the actual bicarbonate is moving up as well from this point you should draw a 45 degrees line and that going to cross the standard bicarbonate line and giving you the actual bicarbonate value what will happen when we do have the compensation the compensation is taking place by the kidney kidney is going to increase the reabsorption of the bicarbonate in the proximal tubules and in the distal one as well plus secreting the hydrogen so we are going to have an increase of the standard bicarbonate so this parallel line has a higher bicarbonate value so everything is shifted to the right so this is the pH going toward the normal values and of course both the standard bicarbonate and the actual bicarbonate is increased but because the PCO2 value is higher than 40 this is why the actual bicarbonate always higher than a standard bicarbonate respiratory alkalosis this is usually due to hyperventilation that this hyperventilation eliminates the amount of co2 and this is caused by for example the loss of the co2 causing the respiratory alkalosis what can it be anxiety hysteric reaction most commonly or respiratory center lesion due to tumor stroke fever salicylate poisoning that independently from the co2 or the oxygen tension that is stimulate let's see the respiratory center or assisted respiration when we do have hyperventilating the patient or when we are moving on a high altitude and the hypoxia is going to stimulate the respiration but that can happen for example in pneumonia as well when the hypoxia stimulates the respiration and this is why the co2 value can be decreased again by looking at this data we are moving down on the standard bicarbonate line by decreasing the co2 value and the ph is going to elevate it as you see here because we have less CO2, actual bicarbonate decreases, but the standard is not because we do have a 40 millimercury of the C, uh, CO2 pressure for the standard bicarbonate.
what will be the compensation and the, and the actual bicarbonate usually the 45 degree it can be calculated and what can be the compensation the kidney is going to compensate is ink uh, decreases the reabsorption of the bicarbonate or retaining the proton and this way generate a little metabolic acidosis so a left shifted parallel line of the standard bicarbonate this is how the pH is going back toward the normal pH Metabolic acidosis, possible this is the most common cause of acid-base disbalance. The major cause usually ingesting an acids or substance that is metabolized to acid or some endogenous acid production such as for example type 1 diabetes or if we do have a serenomous exercise that the lactic acidosis or hypoxia causes lactic acidosis or kidney insufficiency when we do have an inappropriate excretion of the acidic substances and this is why you're losing bicarbonate or excretion of the hydrogen decreased or severe severe diarrhea when we are losing bicarbonate so all the thing that is causes metabolic acidosis so by summarizing metabolic acidosis mainly is altering the bicarbonate the bicarbonate can be decreased by if we do have a proton that buffered by bicarbonate and associated water and CO2 so this is how we are going to lose the bicarbonate or directly we are going to lose the bicarbonate through the kidney or through the intestine now to calculate whether this is due to an extra acid accumulation in our body or this is mainly due to a loss of bicarbonate this is the anion gap is used the anion gap relatively means that basically in our body the, the sum of the anions and the cations it should be equal to each other so if we could measure the all cations and all anions that should be equal to each other but because we are not measuring everything we are measuring the sodium and chloride and bicarbonate we do have an unmeasured cations and unmeasured anions and because the unmeasured anion is less than an unmeasured cations this is why we do have a positive anion gap. This anion gap is plus 10 plus minus 2. Of course, the albumin concentration, the protein concentration is altering. Let's see the anion gap. This is why it should be corrected based on the albumin concentration. Now, if the anion gap is higher than 12, this is and the pH is low, so we have acidemia. This is what is called anion gap acidosis. Make a note. Doesn't matter what the pH is. If anion gap is bigger than 20, we do have a anion gap acidosis, but usually is hidden. If the anion gap doesn't change, that's a non-anion gap acidosis and mainly due to loss of bicarbonate and because the bicarbonate exchange by chloride this is associated with hyperchloremic acidosis in some situation when the corrected anion gap is less than for example the normal that can be due to the low potassium magnesium and calcium or increased globally in some other protein such as the multiple myeloma or lithium or bromidism or you know, either intoxication that can alter that can decrease the anion gap uh, such a value that can be negative as well in this situation now let's summarize these <coughs> changes of anion gap on this bar graph so anion gap meaning that these are the left column is the cations and the right one the anions so cation is the so sodium and then other unmeasured cations why the right one is an ion such as a chloride bicarbonate that is measuring and then additional one that we are not measuring and because the unmeasured anions is bigger than the cations we do have a gap between these two and that's the anion gap so this is the 10 plus minus 2 <coughs> what will happen when we do have an acid and this acid it's going to use up the bicarbonate and when we do have proton accumulation bicarbonate decrease of course this is substituted by the another anion that is a anions of the acid substance so what we have 
by carbonyl decreases, chloride stays the same, and as you see here, the unmeasured anion elevated. So an ion gap is increased. So in this case, the anion gap increased because we do have an acid production. We do have an accumulation of the unmeasured anions. In another case, when we do have an exchange of the bicarbonate with chloride, because we are losing bicarbonate and reabsorbing the chloride, the chloride is going to increase and bicarbonate decrease. The anion gap, so the difference between the unmeasured cation and unmeasured anion is the same, so that's a non-anion gap acidosis. Uh, an ion gap acidosis can be due to some externally ingested substance that is metabolized in our body very frequently. For example, ethanol, methanol, isopropyl alcohol. That can be the substance that's later on metabolized to acidic substances. To figure out whether the patient was taking something or not, the serum osmotic gap is a very useful tool. Normally, the osmolarity of the serum can be calculated by taking twice the sodium and glucose and urea. And if we subtract the measured osmolarity, we do have a little gap. The little gap is about 10 milliosmol per body, about a kilogram of solvent. Now, if we are taking something more, relatively it meaning that we do measure an increase osmolarity in the serum, but the calculate is the same, so the osmotic gap is increased. So usually if the osmotic gap increased, that meaning the patient was taking something from outside. Now, to see whether this uh, bicarbonate loss is due to kidney problem or extra renal problem, we can use urinary anion gap, very similarly to the anion gap in a serum. What does it mean? In the urine, again, the cations and anions should be equal to each other. And what will happen? We calculate it by considering the amount of sodium plus the potassium and we subtract the chloride. If we do have in acidic milieu, we do have a normal kidney function, it meaning that the kidney is going to eliminate the proton by increasing the production of ammonium ion. Now, that's a positively charged anion, so because electron neutrality occurs, so the chloride increases as well, so that's be electron neutral. But because we are not measuring the ammonium, this meaning that this equation should be very negative, so less than minus 10 millimol per liter. That means extra renal the problem because kidney works perfectly. If the kidney doesn't work, that meaning, especially in the distal type of acidification defect, that meaning that the urinary anion gap is bigger than 10. So we cannot relatively increase the ammonium, and this is why the sodium potassium is more than the chloride. This one equation be a high positive value. Now let's see on the Sigur Andersson nomogram what will happen when we do have a metabolic acidosis. When we do have a metabolic acidosis, meaning that we do have a left shift of the standard bicarbonate line, so we do have a decrease of the pH. The first one, the compensatory mechanism, is the lung. The lung is going to eliminate the CO2 value, so it's meaning to decrease the CO2. So this way the pH is moving closer to the normal pH. Later on, if not the kidney is affected, the kidney compensation occurs and the kidney is going to reabsorb the bicarbonate and eliminate the proton. So this line, the standard bicarbonate line, is shifted to the right and we are getting closer to the normal pH. Metabolic alkalosis, when we do have an increase in the pH, and this is not due to respiratory problem. That can happen when we do have an increased bicarbonate, such as taking too much alkaline substance, for example, antacids, or inappropriate treatment of the acidosis when we are infusing too much bicarbonate to the patient, or we are losing hydrogen ion, for example, vomiting by vomiting, or renal loss of acid, especially when we do have a, a contraction of the extracellular volume, some diuretics, so chloride deficiency, or mineralocorticoid, glucocorticoid effect, all can cause metabolic alkalosis by increasing the bicarbonate value.
looking at this Sigurd Andersen nomogram, now we are moving to the right with this standard bicarbonate line and the pH in respiration what will do the respiration the respiration is retaining the co2 value so we are moving up on the well, this line standard bicarbonate line and the ph is getting closer to the normal value later on the kidney is turning on and eliminating the bicarbonate and retaining the proton this standard bicarbonate line is shifted to the left and the ph is goes back toward the normal value Now, after discussing this simple acid-base disorder, let's see the mixed acid-base disorders. First, let's look at these uh, samples, these case studies. The patient was suffering of a traumatic shock, a car accident. He was bleeding and crushed. And let's look at his parameters at the beginning. In the first hour, what the patient had, a very low pH, that means acidemia. By looking at the CO2 value, as you see here, that is less than 40, so the patient is hyperventilating. Because CO2 is less than 40, that's a respiratory alkalosis. So this is not a primary disorder because it will change the pH the opposite way, so that has to be a compensation. Actual and standard bicarbonate decrease, so it's less than 24, meaning this patient has a metabolic acidosis compensated respiratorically. So, this is the primary problem, is the metabolic problem. Possible that's a lactate acidosis that the patient is suffering of. As this is supported by the decreased buffer base and the negative base excess. What will happen one day later? If you look at the acidemia is more severe one. And now by looking at the CO2 value, that's again, that is pointing toward the acidosis, including the metabolic part is a metabolic acidosis so now we do have a mixed acid base disorders we do have a respiratory and metabolic acidosis at the same time possible this is due to the ARDS that is developed due to the circulatory shock now how can we look at and how can we determine whether we do have a mixed or a simple acid base disorders first of all we have to look at the parameter the compensatory part partner if the change is in the wrong direction so it's meaning that they both can cause the underlying problem or it's not change at all so there is no effect on the respiration or on the metabolic component or the change is not enough and this way the patient they're not undercompensating, but it meaning they do have another underlying problem that is going to alter this compensatory process, and this is why the patient cannot compensate enough. Or it's changing too far, so that's a secondary. It looks like it's overcompensating, but it's no overcompensation. Something is driving the compensation further, so some underlying problem, and this is the mixed acid base disorder. The compensation, when we do have exactly just the right compensation occurs, and that's the only simple acid base disorders. Now let's see what the respiratory compensation for metabolic changes. In metabolic acidosis, we do have a hyperventilation, especially in diabetic acidosis, we do have the Kussmaul breathing, that's a deep and rapid high tidal volume. Now, they evaluated a very huge population. They didn't have any kind of respiratory problem, underlying problem, and they looked at a certain bicarbonate value, what kind of CO2 value is was developed. So, for example, if somebody had a decrease of the bicarbonate due to metabolic acidosis, they are going to decrease the CO2 value by respiration. And that was the Winters formula, and that can be calculated by one and a half times the bicarbonate value plus eight plus minus two. So that should be the normal range. You can evaluate by only looking at the CO2 value and the last digit of the pH. For example, the pH is 7.25. So by considering the 25 millimercury should be the normal respiratory compensation. Or similarly, by looking at the base excess and the changes of the PO2 value, that's give you roughly what could be the normal compensation. 
In a metabolic alkalosis, the hypoventilation is not as good as a, in metabolic acidosis, the hyperventilation, because the hypoxia is limiting basically the compensation. And this equation or this correlation is roughly can be described what should be the PCO2 value. As you see here, it's 0.9 times by carbonate plus 15, or again, the changes of the CO2, this should be equal with the base excess changes times 0.6. Similarly to acute hypercapnia or hypocapnia, what will happen? Normally, without having any kind of compensation, the CO2 is going to increase the bicarbonate, but this changes about every 10 millimercury of CO2, it's increased the bicarbonate by one millimole per liter. So relatively, in acute situation, the bicarbonate value never will exceed the normal value. And the standard bicarbonate is normal. However, when we do have a chronic hypercapnia, when the kidney is going to uh, re, uh, let's see, reabsorb the bicarbonate, 10 millimercury of CO2 changes is initiating 4 millimole uh, changes of the bicarbonate. So immediately we are getting out from the normal range. So the actual bicarbonate be out of under range and the standard bicarbonate increased. The compensation roughly about the changes of the CO2 times 0.4 that should be the same as the base excess. So this is how we can calculate it. In acute hypocapnia, very similarly, if we do have a decrease of the CO2 value, that is going to decrease the actual bicarbonate about 1 to 2 millimole per liter, similar to the acute hypercapnia. So there's no changes in the actual bicarbonate, it's still in the normal range, and the standard bicarbonate is still normal. However, in chronic hypercapnia, hypocapnia, when we do have a kidney compensation, that's decreased be much more because a kidney is going to let, let's see, the bicarbonate to excrete it, to be excreted, and this way the P CO2 is be less than 40. And you can calculate very similarly to the hypercapnia, the delta changes of the CO2 about 0.4 times should be the base excess. This is how you can calculate it. Now, in those conditions, when we do have an ion gap acidosis, we can detect whether the patient does have an additional non anion gap acidosis or an additional metabolic alkalosis behind of the primary problem. Because if we do have a pure anion gap acidosis, it's meaning that as much as the acid accumulated, the bicarbonate decreased, and this is how the anion gap increased. So this change is the same, that we do have only a simple anion gap metabolic acidosis. However, if we do have a bigger change in the anion gap, so we do have much more acid in the system that the bicarbonate decreased, that is meaning we do have an extra bicarbonate left, so it's meaning we do have a metabolic alkalosis in the, under uh, the situation. Now, however, if the anion gap doesn't change as much as the bicarbonate, it's meaning that we lost too much bicarbonate, and this meaning we do have a non-anion gap acidosis, plus we do have an anion gap acidosis at the same time. Because we don't like to compare the delta-delta changes, this is why they introduced a corrected bicarbonate. This corrected bicarbonate is simply correcting the actual bicarbonate by the changes of an ion gap. If the decrease of bicarbonate is same as an increase of an ion gap, this corrected bicarbonate, be the normal bicarbonate value, should be about 24 plus minus 2. So it meaning that there is no additional uh, metabolic disorders. However, if the corrected bicarbonate is less than 22, so it's meaning that the measured bicarbonate is less or changed more than an ion gap increase, that we do have a non-anion gap acidosis at the same time in the patient. Or if we do have relatively 
less changes of the bicarbonate that we could calculate from the acid accumulation, that is meaning we do have a coexisting metabolic alkalosis. To understand this situation, we do have a little a rule how you can follow and how you can evaluate the acid-base disorders of the patient. Let's look at First of all, you have to look at the pH. The pH is going to tell you whether we do have acidemia or we do have alkalemia. If the pH is less than 7.4, that's acidemia. If it's more than 7.4, that means alkalemia. The next one, you have to figure out what is the underlining problem, what is the primary disturbances. Okay, let's look at the bicarbonate and the CO2. Whichever can explain the changes of the pH, that's the underlining problem. So in a case of acidemia, if the bicarbonate decreased, yes, that's a primary metabolic acidosis. If the CO2 is increased, that's a primary respiratory acidosis. In case of alkalemia, if we do have an increase of the bicarbonate, that means primary metabolic alkalosis. If we do have a decrease of the CO2, that means a primary respiratory alkalosis. This is how we can determine which is a primary disorder. The next one, calculate an ion gap, or if it's needed when the albumin concentration is different, calculate the corrected uh, an ion gap. If you do have an acidemia, if an ion gap is bigger than 12, you consider that's an ion gap acidosis. If there is 12 or 10 plus minus 2, that's not an ion gap acidosis. That, don't forget it. If the an ion gap independently from the pH of the bicarbonate value is bigger than 20, you always have in the back a, an ion gap acidosis. Step 4. Let's look at the compensation. If you do have a primary metabolic acidosis, let's use the Winters formula to see whether the, compens the respiratory compensation works fine or not. If we do have a less PCO2 that is needed, we do have a respiratory alkalosis at the same time. That can be due to hypoxia, for example, pneumonia, or can be fever, can be some kind of drug that stimulates the breathing. Or when the PCO2 value is higher than an expected one, it could be less than 40, but not as low as it could be calculated, that meaning that the patient could not breathe enough. So they do have another underlying problem, possibly an obstructed uh, lung problem, for example, obstructed uh, emphysema or chronic obstruction lung diseases that is preventing, let's see, or inhibiting the respiration. The last one, if you do have an ion gap acidosis, let's calculate the corrected bicarbonate and see whether we do have an other underlining metabolic disorder such as a non-anion gap acidosis or a metabolic alkalosis behind. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to show you step by step different cases, how you can, uh, how you can figure out the underlying disorders and underlying problem with this patient by evaluating its acid-base balance.